Good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 17th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee? Can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones as they do affect the broadcasting system? Um, agenda item one today is subordinate legislation. Uh, we will hear evidence on the HGV speed limit M9A9 trunk road regulations 2014 from Keith Brown, the Minister of Transport for Transport and Veterans, Scott Lees, Head of Network Operations, and Stuart Wilson, Development Management and Strategic Road Safety Manager for the Scottish Government. The instrument is laid under affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before the provisions may come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited to consider a motion to approve the instrument under agenda item two. So can I welcome the witnesses and Minister, can I invite you to make any opening remarks? Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and uh, delighted to speak to uh, the proposal to promote a an HGV 50 mile an hour speed limit uh, in the regulations which have been mentioned. Uh, we're doing this for a number of reasons. Uh, the expected benefits of the proposed HGV pilot are spread across uh, four key areas. Uh, all of which are considered uh, be, being significant to road safety, but also for business in the Highlands and connectivity to and from the Central Belt. So the main areas are, first of all, improved journey time reliability, a positive economic impact across a range of indicators, and wider road safety improvements, as well as environmental benefits. Uh, the A9, I think, as everyone knows, is one of Scotland's most important links, and the pilot really is just one of the many engineering, enforcement and education measures which are being introduced to improve the safety and operation of the route ahead of duelling. An extensive view of the available evidence has been undertaken in considering the pilot, and we've also taken the views of A9 users, the business community and hauliers into account. The raising of the speed limit for HGVs is an integral part of the wider A9 safety initiative, and it's linked directly uh, to the introduction of the average speed camera system. The strategy for the deployment of the average speed camera system is that it will provide 100% cover of all single carriageway sections of the A9 impacted by raising the HGV speed limit. Speed limit. It's also clear that the speed camera systems will bring safety improvements to the route and the pilots will bring operational benefits and may also further improve driver behaviour by reducing driver frustration. The Road Haulage Association has assured me that they will also work with their drivers to make sure they adhere to the most professional standards uh, for the duration of the trial, hopefully in perpetuity, uh, they will be customising their training with regards to the A9 as well as implementing an education campaign themselves. Uh, the pilot uh, for the raising of the speed limit is dependent upon the introduction of the average speed camera system and we will be using uh, several measures to judge its success including before and after surveys as well as monitoring changes in overtaking behaviour. Uh, the speed limit, just to be clear, is not being changed for vehicles other than HGVs above 7.5 tonnes, so there will be no confusion to other motorists uh, or tourists. And the revised speed limit will be signed and used as part of the wider interim safety plan proposals to improve safety for all users of the A9. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Adam, would you like to start off the questioning, please? Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. Everything else being equal, it's a wee bit counterintuitive to uh, suggest that road safety would be improved by increasing a speed limit on HGV vehicles um, on, on the A9. Um, could you perhaps um, develop your, uh, your thoughts on why, why this would actually be of significant benefit? Because... Um, According to the Transport Research Laboratory, um, who did a report for Transport Scotland back in 2009, uh, they concluded by saying reduction in the, in the number of accidents is likely to be greater if the speed limit is retained at 40 miles an hour for HGVs rather than increased to 50 miles an hour. Uh, yes, I've seen that, that, that study, and um, I think our point is that um, 
the way in which it will improve um, accident statistics and the safety of the road is first of all by uh, reducing the levels of queuing which you currently see um, and overtaking uh, associated with uh, slow moving HGVs. You appreciate just now you have quite a substantial differential between the 60 mile an hour limit for other vehicles and the 40 mile an hour limit for uh, HGVs and that differential uh, we believe causes frustration. Uh, and also we can reduce frustration by taking this measure. Uh, also, it's true to say that um, this measure has been introduced, as I've said, along with the average speed camera system, which I think is very important. One of the main uh, representations that I had received was from hauliers who regularly obeyed the speed limits, even had limiters in their, in their vehicles to make sure they couldn't exceed the 40 mile an hour limit. And they felt, given the fact that the average speed for HGVs coming down that road before this introduction was 56 miles an hour, that it wasn't a level playing field. And so obviously it's a competitive environment for hauliers and they want to see it uh, leveled. So if you could increase the speed limit, uh, reduce the uh, frustration, reduce some of the overtaking maneuvers which are undertaken, but also make it a level playing field and one which is enforced, then it means it's better for the, the industry generally. Um, as I say, the current average speed uh, limit on uh, the, the single carriageway parts of the road is 50 miles an hour or in excess of that for HG vehicles. Um, and we also believe there can be substantial savings in terms of 150,000 vehicle hours per uh, year of journey time. But going back to the point about TRL, it's also worth saying that they highlighted the use, it highlighted the, the A9 as a suitable location for an HGV uh, speed limit pilot given the levels of monitoring which will be put in place uh, and the presence of the average speed camera system. So uh, I'm familiar with the average uh, speed camera system mm -hmm. given that uh, it's uh, a feature of the A77 um, uh, south of Kilmarnock down uh, through uh, or the bypass through air. Um, is, is what you're suggesting predicated on, on the camera system being up and running before you actually uh, uh, introduce the pilot? Uh, it's predicated on them happening simultaneously. Um, and uh, you've mentioned the M77, <coughs> which I think is an important point. The <coughs> studies which, was, which have been done on the effect of the average speed camera system, they are recorded around two less fatal accidents per year. Uh, apart from the personal tragedy involved in any fatal accident, there's also a cost of around £2 million to the public agencies each time that happens. Uh, but in terms of reducing accidents, and especially fatal accidents, it's proven to be extremely effective. And that's why we believe the two things should happen at the same time. We shouldn't really have one without the other. Um, I think there was a point made by Alec Johnson publicly as well, that you should consider these two things together, which is what we've done. And that, along with another number of other measures, for example, you may have heard the campaign about uh, overtaking, uh, quite a graphic campaign on radio, the tick, tick, tick of the indicator, and people saying this could be the last sound that you hear, uh, because we, we know that is uh, a cause of accidents on that road. So uh, that's why we think the two things uh, should go together, that we properly enforce the speed limits which were there, but we uh, try to reduce frustration uh, and the platooning and the queuing which goes on. Thank you. Minister, you mentioned the uh, ec um, potential economic uh, increase or impact of the uh, increasing the speed limit. Could you um, maybe expand on that a bit? What what were you thinking of in terms of economic impact? Well, I, I suppose two main aspects. One, in terms of um, uh, journey time, which can be reduced for HGVs. Um, uh, previously travelling at 40, and they've been able to travel at 50. So I think I mentioned 150,000 uh, hours has been a, a reduction. Now, that obviously factors through to um, time spent uh, for drivers, uh, uh, fuel, um, but having that journey time reliability as well as the reduction is very important so people can make an estimate of what it will take to go th the length of what's one of the most important economic routes uh, in the country. So it's both in terms of journey time savings and the savings that can produce for companies and ultimately customers by bearing down on costs of uh, transportation, but also in planning, being able to have more certainty as to how long it will take you to use that road. Okay, uh, Mark. I think, Kavina, as part of that economic uh, 
modelling there's there been any assessment of what the impact will be on rail freight um, by mm -hmm. increasing the speed limit for HGVs? Well, we have um, in the STPR uh, in 2008 uh, undertaken work uh, since then to highlight the commitment to both road and rail freight, and the STPR highlighted the duelling of the A9 and improvement to the Highland uh, mainline, both of which are being progressed. So we're working closely with Network Rail in developing phase two of the Highland mainline improvements project, uh, and rail enhancements include uh, provision of uh, bi-directional sign signalling to reduce the impact of engineering works on the route, increasing the length of freight loops and also removing speed limits below 75 miles per hour for freight trains. So it's not uh, the case that we're just looking at the road uh, option here, but we're also improving the rail option. And I think those improvements which we've talked about should help to increase the attractiveness of rail. And we've also seen, I think, one or two pilots, one particularly the whisky trains you may have heard about, uh, especially coming from Murray, but using the A9, uh, where the whisky industry has got together uh, with the support of the Scottish Government to take freight from uh, road and put it onto rail. Um, and we're hopeful that these kind of pilots and the increasing awareness of the benefits of using rail uh, will, will factor through. So we're not just taking uh, one side of this, we're trying to improve both routes, uh, including the attractiveness for, for rail. Can I ask if a climate change uh, impact assessment has been done on varying the speed, on changing the speed limit? Well, it's certainly true to say that we expect there to be environmental benefits from this. I would mean, ask Scott to come back on the, 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 the assessments, the detail of the assessments which have been done. And the reason for that is just as you've seen when you come across the, the new, um, when you come across the, the fourth road bridge just now, um, the alleviation of the queuing. I just used that route myself this morning, so it's not completely alleviated, but it does mean that the traffic passes more freely and you don't have the same stop and start, which is extremely damaging to the environment. You know, cars having to accelerate and stop and start and so on. Um, so we know that the, that will reduce all the beneficial impact on the environment. I don't know if Scott or Stuart wants to come in on the other I'll take that from you, Minister. Good morning, everybody. There hasn't been a specific assessment of how much CO2 might be saved, for instance, by the journey to uh, savings the Minister spoken about. We have done a lot of environmental work in terms of the average speed cameras and the 50 mile hour monitoring. One thing to say, from experience of other, other average speed camera systems, which the 50 mile hour pilot sits in the context of, the, tr the smoother traffic flows and more uh, organised speed, for want of a better description, means typically the engines are running more efficiently. Also, when we're speaking to the Road Haulage Association and Freight Transport Association, one thing they've made quite clear is that an HGV running at 40, a modern HGV isn't running its engine efficiently. They're much more comfortable running at 50, 55 miles an hour because that's you know, what they're designed for. There will be savings, but I can't quantify precisely what they would be in that sense. Again, the dynamics of the A9 traffic flow are quite uh, unique in many respects. So on an annual basis, it's not really possible to say that. OK, thank you. Uh, Jim? Uh, just on that last point, um, Mr Wilson, you said that no specific assessment on the CO2, CO2 emissions had been undertaken. Can I ask why and if that is something that will be done in the future? We won't be doing it specifically, but the A9 dueling team are doing a much wider assessment of how the A9 will perform into the future with uh, differing speed limits. Given the, I'll say, relatively small numbers of HGVs, if you imagine right now 95% of the HGVs on the A9 are speeding, as the Minister said, the average speed is already approximately 50 miles an hour. The number of HGVs whose speed characteristics will change is relatively low. So 150,000 vehicle hours is what we'd expect in journey time savings. But in terms of... Uh, carbon savings is too small a number to, to be accurate on. So is it not possible to undertake the assessment then? Is that what you're saying? You could do number crunching, but the validity of the number would be questionable. I think what we can do, we're going to have quarterly assessments <coughs> of this, and what we can do is, uh, for the benefit of the, the committee, uh, at least do the calculation on the 150,000 hours which we expect to save. I mean, that will be a a judgment on what the average uh, cost in terms of the environment is, so that uh, 150,000 extra uh, hours being used by HGVs. But I think it's probably harder to quantify exactly what we save, uh, not just in terms of the hours, but in terms of the profile of the traffic. If you think back, to, for example, to the M74 extension, before that came in, uh, I think we'd all experienced the um, pretty horrendous um, conditions on the Kingston Bridge with traffic back, uh, back for many miles. And what you had was traffic 
you know, moving forward, um, stopping and starting, and that's extremely damaging. Probably harder to quantify that, but I think we can, uh, for the benefit of the committee, look at extrapolating the 150,000 hours for a figure in terms of what we'd expect to save in terms of environmental um, emissions. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, you have already said, you've talked about the importance of introducing the increase in the HGV speed limit at the same time as the um, use of average speed cameras. Um, and you've said that it's necessary to do those two things in parallel in order to derive the benefits that you've outlined principally around safety. But the Transport Research Laboratory report that Mr Ingram referred to, um, which was commissioned by Transport Scotland states, and I quote, it appears that there would be a safety benefit associated with the installation of average speed cameras, whether or not the speed limit applicable to heavy goods vehicles were increased. So I'm just keen to understand better, given that you could have the benefit without the installation of the average speed cameras, why you are convinced that that's something that has to happen together, rather than waiting for an assessment of the impact of that before increasing the speed limit? I know uh, well, we're going to do both simultaneously, so both things will happen at the same time. And the reason why we link those two things together, there is a benefit, uh, we believe, uh, economically and in terms, uh, to some extent, in terms of safety by introducing the speed limit, because uh, there, there are both sides to it. The TRL report, which you mentioned, will also say an increase in speed limit can cause uh, an increase in accidents. It's possible that can happen. Um, but if that's mitigated by the fact that you have uh, proper enforcement, bearing in mind what's been said already about the, the actual average speed of HGVs on that route at the present time, if you have that enforcement and if you can take away some of the things which uh, are, are causation factors for accidents, I've mentioned frustration, but some overtaking moves when people become um, uh, exasperated and they undertake an, over, uh, an overtaking manoeuvre which you wouldn't otherwise do, um, but the, the frustration drives to that. We believe there's savings in terms of accidents that can arise from that, but we do also believe that it should be properly enforced. And the enforcement of the average speed cameras, I think, sits with the increase in, space, in speed limit, but that's not the only reason for the introduction of the average speed cameras. And it's worth bearing in mind that uh, our intention to, and all the work that's currently being done to dual the A9, um, that uh, that will in itself, because of the 12 different phases of that, will require would have required average speed cameras in any event. When you're undertaking that kind of online work, you have to have that. If you think back to the, the M80 works, there was an average speed camera system on there for the duration of the works that were undertaken. Uh, so we would have to have had average speed cameras on different sections of the A9 in any event. Uh, we just believe it's um, sensible for us, uh, given what's been said. I think Mr Ingram mentioned the benefits and at the M77 to do both things. And that's 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 got a wider application, the application of the average speed cameras than just relating to the increase in the speed limit for HGVs. It's got other benefits as well. So that's why we think both things are best done together. And just finally, what is the evidence base for the conclusions that you've reached and what work has been undertaken to arrive at these conclusions? It has been substantial work undertaken by the A9 Safety Group, which includes, for example, the Safety Camera Partnerships, uh, Police Scotland, crucially, who've got the expertise in this area, uh, and also uh, taking into account the, the um, statements made and, and uh, views of road users. So the RHA um, are involved in this as well, and the Rail Freight Group, uh, sorry, the, the Transport uh, Freight Group uh, are also involved in this. So they've taken uh, the most expert uh, people we can um, uh, talk to in relation to this, but we've also paid uh, heed to the views expressed by users. I think, there was a, I think there was a petition in relation to this before, certainly been representations for a number of years from the road haulage industry making these points uh, that they believe this would actually improve safety. I mean, the other thing you can start to um, uh, tackle is things like um, elephant racing, whereby when you suddenly come across a dual carriageway section, an HGV pulls out to overtake another HGV travelling slower, and the traffic which is looking for that relief from the dual carriageway to get past is unable to do that. And this, if you increase the average speed of these um, vehicles, being able to do 50 mile an hour before they reach that point, it reduces the elements of that. And I should also just say that I mentioned Police Scotland. There's been quite a change uh, in how the A9 is policed with the advent of Police Scotland. You've now got a dedicated trunk road um, uh, police monitoring unit. Uh, there's a greater presence now. In the past, there had to be um, coordinated between different
different police forces. Now we've got one uh, unified police force there. So we've taken the advice of these people in relation to that and also looked at, as you've mentioned already, the TRL study and such evidence is out there already. So HGVs will now be allowed to do 50 miles an hour uh, along the route. What what is the average speed? The, um, but the average speed cameras are going to apply to all vehicles. Yes. So what is the average speed that you expect people to do on that road? The, the legal speed limit or less, I think, is the, the short answer. But of course, there's still that differential between all other traffic which can uh, travel at 60 miles an hour. Uh, and you've got the HGVs, which are currently restricted to 40 miles an hour on the single dual carriageway, it's 50 miles an hour on the dual carriageway. So we expect, uh, with the application of the speed cameras, uh, to have uh, people obeying the speed limit. So we're looking for uh, average speeds. Um, well, just now you've got an average speed in excess, 10 miles in excess of the legal limit. That's the average speed for HGVs, and we're looking to try and reconcile those two figures. And the on the schedule, it's the, um, the E9 from Lunkerty to Moy is divided into about eight parts. Does that mean that there'll be average speed over each of these eight parts? No, the average speed cameras that allow us to get information as to the average speeds uh, of, uh, and the survey work that we're undertaking will allow us to get average speed right across the length of the A9 a from Perth to Inverness. That's the intention behind it. In fact, even beyond that, coming to Stirling, because the average speed camera will cover Stirling to Perth as well. So uh, that that's information, and I should just point out that the cameras are the latest uh, digital cameras, so they're able to differentiate between types of vehicles to make sure they're travelling at the correct speed. But that will give us much more information about what the average speed uh, is along the length of the A9. I don't know if you want to say anything further on that, Stuart. Sure. Before you bring in uh, Mr Wilson, so um, I'm just trying to get how do you police it? Do you fine people for going above the average speed over a stretch? And can you... Is what I'm trying to get at, could you get, you know, three or four different fines or tickets because you're travelling at a great, at a, over the limit, if you like, uh, on different stretches. Well, obviously it's, it's possible for somebody to use part of the A9. Um, so the average speed that they've used on the A9 uh, will be taken into account. So you could be fined for one part. You could go along the A9, come off, don't care, come back on, go back. So yes, you could be fined uh, more than once for that. I don't know if you want to say any more mechanics of it, though, Stuart. Yeah, thanks, Minister. The eight sections which are set out in the schedule are the single carriageway sections between Perth and Inverness. Between Perth and Inverness, the average speed cameras only apply to the single carriageway sections. Now, the operating strategy in terms of what sections are live and what sections aren't will fall to the safety camera partnerships. Transport Scotland won't know what sections are or are not under enforcement. The point for drivers is you shouldn't know you should drive at the speed limit. Not all of the sections will be alive, and the Home Office type approval for the system requires that you have to enforce within a single geometry, in the sense you can do single or dual carriageway, but you couldn't enforce over a combination of the two. And the strategy for Perth and Burness is very much based around the accidents are currently on the single carriageway sections, therefore the average speed cameras are devoted to enforcing on the single carriageway sections. They won't enforce on the dual carriageways. The police and safety camera partnership can deal with that as part of a separate strategy. In terms of could you pick up more than one uh, penalty, if you like, for driving by excess speed, yes, you could. If you passed through two live sections and you were recorded twice as having driven you know, at excess speed, average speed cameras are fairer than the kind of fixed Gatso cameras. You can adjust your speed over a long distance simply to maintain an average. Quite often you can make a mistake over a relatively short distance, pass a fixed camera site, and you have points. So. It allows the driver to be more disciplined in terms of how they use the route, drive at a fixed speed, which you know, 60 miles an hour, up to 70 miles an hour for cars on the dual carriageways. You can do Perth and Vaness comfortably in two hours or less. There's you know, a lot of evidence, and be it from what we've collected or what the A9 dueling team have collected, some folk are achieving that trip in 90 minutes. We've seen average speeds of 80, 90 miles an hour, point speeds of 125 miles an hour. Now, we just recently completed some driver surveys where three quarters of the people we interviewed admitted having sped at least once on their most recent trip on A9. Most of that was a relatively low uh, three or four miles an hour above the speed limit. A third admitted 10 miles an hour above the speed limit. A fifth admitted 15 miles an hour above the speed limit. And that was car drivers, that wasn't HGV drivers, that was just folk that we spoke to. And you know, credit their candour, that's what they admitted to doing. That's what a lot of people do in the A9. Not, not the majority. Only a third of cars are speeding. Two thirds are driving on or around the speed limit. Again, just reinforcing the point the minister's made. 
by raising the HGV speed limit on the one hand and introducing an average speed camera system on the other. The current legal speed range, if you like, is 40 for HGVs. Most of them don't do it. To 60 for cars, and a third of them are travelling faster than that. The desired speed's closer to 70 when you look at some of the modelling outputs. You bring all of that down to 50 to 60. Everyone can travel with a relatively small speed range. And anyone who does that, the average speed cameras are irrelevant. If you're obeying the law, they don't exist. It simply requires you to obey the law and think about what you're doing. If you don't do that, you've got every possibility of picking up penalties for driving you know, at excess speed. You'd have to be doing that over a long distance consistently. And those are exactly the people we want to kind of moderate the behaviour of. And in um, our local paper in the North East, Nest Camp pu published where the uh, speed cameras are going to be operating in the, in the following week. Will that happen on the A9? Well, it's going to be substantial signage in a public education campaign to alert people to the existence of the average speed cameras. But the ones I think you're talking about are ones which are mobile, which the police can move around so they'll let people know. Because the intention is to try and prevent speeding rather than collect fines. And just to kill off one myth, we don't get the cash from the fines. The government doesn't get that. The camera safety partnerships don't get that directly as well. It goes back to the Treasury. Um, but um, no, because these cameras will be at fixed points and they'll be well advertised before that, so it wouldn't be the same situation as you mentioned in the North East. OK, thanks. Alex? The, I was allocated the issue as enforcement, uh, and we've covered the vast majority of that already. There's a couple of points I'd like to clarify. Uh, first of all, are you confident that the uh, electronic <coughs> measures, the, the average speed cameras, uh, will in themselves be the main enforcement measure? for this uh, change in the rules? Uh, no, we've not said that, that that should be the main enforcement measure. It is, it is genuinely a suite of different measures, and it started already. The education campaign we've talked about, generally the education campaign for overtaking for all drivers, but also mentioned the education campaign and training that will be undertaken by the RHA of their members as well. And these are really important, plus the additional um, policing uh, that I've mentioned a much more coordinated way of policing the A9 in particular. There will still be police on this road, it won't be left just to the speed cameras. So the speed cameras are an integral and very important part of it, but they're not the only part of it. I was going to go on to the issue of policing uh, and the numbers of police officers that are likely to be involved. Now, you've said that there's already been a change to the structure with the, the change in the boundaries for the police. Uh, do you envisage the introduction of this measure requiring additional police presence on the road, or will the police presence on the road remain as it has been since the last reorganisation? Well, you know that the levels of policing and the deployment of police forces is not a matter that we have any control over. It will be for the police to decide upon that, and they will take that decision based on what they perceive the problem to be. But what we've been told by the police is that this makes it, that the change to Police Scotland makes it much more manageable for them to do this. You've got a head of road safety for the whole of Scotland now, um, Chief Superintendent Ian Murray. So he has control over this, and he thinks it's a much more effective way of dealing with this. I mean, in the past, um, you've had a Tayside, a Highland, a, and even Central Scotland police involved in this. So whether it was a case that they always allocated the resources to their part of it, um, a, I think is open to question. But what they can do much more effectively now is police the entire route in that sense. And they'll have a, a of course, they'll have an idea of which uh, are the points that they want to put particular police presence on. I mean, it's also not, not just in relation to safety in terms of uh, speed and so on. It's when there's bad weather and so on, the police will up their presence here. But that, that will remain a matter for the police. But they think it will have a more intensive uh, policing um, now than it has had in the past because of the structural changes that they've had. We've, we've all very carefully alluded to the fact that prior to this measure, it's possible that some HGVs have been exceeding the speed limit. Uh, and we've suggested that what we envisage is perhaps not much change uh, in the, the speed that vehicles are actually travelling at, but that it will be required uh, to regulate that new speed. Do you envisage at the outset uh, a requirement to intensify policing activity to ensure that we don't see uh, drivers simply exceeding the new limit by the same margin they exceeded the old limit? Well, of course, that, that 
I think would be the danger if you didn't have the average speed cameras. Mm -hmm. Because if you suddenly increase the speed limit, if people have become used to the idea they can exceed the existing speed limit by 10 miles an hour, then intuitively you might think, well, the same drivers might make the same calculation they can go 10 miles above that speed limit. I'm not saying they would. Um, and also, it's not just, I think, an intuition that they're currently exceeding the limit. I think we've pretty established the evidence base is there for that, that uh, the majority of HGVs do exceed the current speed limit. And also, for the reasons which I think Stuart mentioned, where it is quite frustrating um, on two levels. First of all, that you can see your competitor whizzing by you if they're breaking the speed limit and you're obeying the speed limit. Um, so that, that frustration uh, is less. But also, if the vehicle you're driving is designed to go at a higher speed, more comfortably at a higher speed than the 40 miles an hour that you're limited to, that will, that will help reduce frustration as well. So, I mean, the, the question of the intensity of the policing operation will depend. Obviously, the introduction, when it happens, will be a high point, I would imagine, for... Um, a greater police presence when people are becoming used to the system. As I said, bad weather will mean, I think, in more intensive policing. But I think in general terms, they've, they've made a commitment. And to be honest, I, I travel at A9 pretty regularly myself, and I've seen that increased presence since the advent of Police Scotland. Um, and, a, you know, I've travelled the road in a police car as well, and they will tell you that they, they're much better placed now to have a coordinated policing um, of that road, but also to make sure they can allocate additional resources when there's particular issues caused by bad weather, or even an accident as well. Uh, I mean, in the past, you had, I think, I'm right in saying, one police force may have had laser equipment to deal with an accident afterwards by taking the measurements so they could deal with it more quickly. Uh, well, we have um, helped to fund the police to get more laser equipment for um, uh, for Police Scotland generally, so they'll have that availability right across um, the, right across the, the A9. So I think you'll see real improvements um, to the policing. I think we're seeing them already, and I think you'll see that uh, through this pilot uh, and also with the average speed cameras. Something you could perhaps clarify for me that maybe I should know, but uh, I'll ask the question now so that I'm better informed. Uh, the resource... Uh, requirement for uh, running and monitoring the average speed camera system. Does that come through the Police Scotland budget or is there an alternative budget stream to cover that? Uh, well, it's partially funded by, obviously, the fines. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the fines go to the Treasury. The Treasury give back money for the running of these um, systems as well. So that's that's partially how it's funded. What we will fund is the, I've mentioned the laser equipment already, but also, I think, £245,000 for the increased signage and so on that's associated with uh, with this. I don't know if you were saying a word about that, Scott. Um, yes, uh, the, the safety camera partnerships are, are funded through Transport Scotland. Um, uh, uh, we currently um, cover the eight partnerships um, around Scotland. Um, any changes in resource uh, because of this scheme will, will be um, covered by Transport Scotland. They are currently being reviewed, obviously, with the eight that are there currently. Um, they have to reflect the changes which have happened in terms of policing. So I think I'm right in saying the cam camera safety partnerships, which are there just now, are being re reviewed, the structures of them. Mary, have you got anything Thank to you. Um, convene and Good morning, Minister. Morning. I wonder if you could give me some detail around the procedures that will be put in place for review reviewing the increased um, speed limit. You, you mentioned in your opening remarks op op um, before and after surveys. I wonder if you could give me a bit more detail around them but also what other procedures will be put in place to review it? Well, well, that's right. First of all, the before and after surveys, if you want to try and take a judgment on the effect of a particular measure, you really have to right. have that uh, data to, to make an assessment. But over and above that, I've mentioned the fact that we'll do three monthly um, surveys and evaluation of how this is progressing. But as to more detail on that, I don't know if it's Stuart or... Yeah, I'll take one. Yep, uh, alluded earlier to the driver interviews we just completed, those were part of the before survey. We're doing a lot of operational work as well, given you know, there's quite an extensive available data set on the A9, both from what we had previously and for the dueling works. We felt it was appropriate, particularly given the structure of the average speed camera system, to get a bit more detail on that. So we're looking at the uh, speed along sections of the A9 and overtaking and accidents and other figures which we will be able to monitor and report quarterly. We'll repeat the before survey six months after the average speed cameras in place, so that will be in April or May of next year. And again, that's very much based around people's experience of using the route, how they use it themselves and how they feel other people use it. And there is a section in there on how they feel that various enforcement measures would contribute to the safety of the route. And some of the initial feedback we've had, people wanted more enforcement, they wanted more police, they wanted more cameras. That's what they said in the context of the kind of feedback we've had. But still, we're one of the most intensively monitored routes, both in terms of what we're doing for the interim safety plan 
and to support the duelling, because the Z9 evolves into the future. It will change. The dynamics of the route will evolve, and we're very conscious that the baseline strategy and the future strategy have to reflect that. So we can take individual sections that haven't been duelled and still make a definitive comment on the speed, the overtaking, the accidents in this section have changed or not changed, and we can relate it back to other things, be it the fact that the section south is now duelled, where five years previously it was not, perhaps. So there's, there's an awful lot of work going on just in terms of getting the baseline right, asking the right questions now, and mapping out how we go three, five, ten years on in the future with it. So will the surveys be done on the different sections on the route or across the whole route? The driver interviews were done at various points on the route, where the Perth, Inverness, Pit Lockery, Dunkeld, the main places where the users of the A9 could actually be interviewed in context. It was very important to get the right number of people. We also sought to get leisure users, business users, commuters, and there were certain quota set up by the people who did the surveys just to ensure a degree of robustness. And again, when we do that next year, we'll repeat that same place. I mean, we won't get the same people, obviously, but it's very much around trying to get the same spectrum of people asking the same questions and you know, do an analysis of the answers. And in terms of the operational surveys, yes, they can be done on a section-by-section -section basis. Effectively, they have to be, as the A9 gets duelled, some sections effectively will be lost. So you need to be able to distill down what happened in the other sections and make a, an informed judgment on those. And will you be monitoring accident levels on different sections of the route? Yes. Um, and, and how the speed cameras, or the average speed cameras, actually operate in the different sections and yeah. doing comparisons between them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it will be monitored extensively. It's one of the, I think, the most... Uh, extensively monitored routes we will have, both in terms of our ability to get information on it and the need to <coughs> answer questions on it. Yeah. Mm, okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Ian Gordon. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, Minister, in your opening remarks, you referred to the introduction of the 50 mile an hour as being a pilot scheme. Um, I'm just wondering um, if, you are con if this proves to be successful and the, the number of accidents and injuries and fatalities are reduced, if you're intending to roll it out to other trunk roads like the A70 or A70 or one that runs through my constituency? Uh, no, I, I have no intentions and no plans to do that. And the reason for that is I think the A9 is quite unique in respect of that. And actually, we've had a substantial number of representations from people on other routes that felt this may happen there that would be very concerned about that. They don't have um, the same characteristics of, uh, as the A9. So, no, this pilot is for the A9 specifically and not for uh, wider use. How, how do you measure the, that it's unique, given that you know drivers' frustration is common in all single carriageway uh, trunk roads like the A70 or the A71? And if you look at the injury stats for roads in Scotland, um, you find that the A70 and A71 are both consistently higher than the A9 in terms of injuries per kilometre. And you know, surely, if we want to address the idea of driver frustration trying to overtake at dangerous bends, dangerous junctions like the Dalmahoy Junction, etc., then um, it would be sensible to roll it out if it proves successful in the A9. Uh, well, I don't think that, that road, um, which I don't use as much as the A9, has the same characteristics as the A9. I mean, you mentioned the Dalmahoy Junction, and that's I don't think it's a comparable junction on the A9 in that respect. Um, it's also worth looking at um, the UK government had looked at this issue of uh, a general 50, uh, increase to 50 miles an hour for, for these vehicles across the, um, the rest of the UK, or at least in, in England. And they've now come back from that position and said they don't intend to do that. And I, I think that's, uh, well, that, that's their decision, but I think our decision is very much based on the fact that the A9 is unique. I think you make a very good point, though, about the accident stats because the perception has grown that the A9 is worse than any other road and that's simply not borne out by the statistics but it is simply the fact that people do feel um, worried on that route. And just to go back to another point if I could that um, it's not just for those that would not want to have average speed cameras having the ability to do under uh, to, to take the overtaking manoeuvres that they do or to drive in the way that they do you can say, well, that's their decision and they're putting their lives at risk. There's many people, and I think the majority of people, want to travel that road safely and feel sometimes worried by some of the behaviour that they see on that road. So it's trying to address those concerns, those safety concerns. So I, I think the A9 is unique in that respect, um, and it's also um, a hugely important arterial route for the north of Scotland coming to the south and vice versa. But I don't think there are other roads, including the one that you mentioned, which have the same characteristics. But I don't know if there's a more technical explanation that the guys would want to give on that. Add a wee bit for me, Minister. I mean, 
part of the consideration for the A9 in terms of the single carriageway is it's a much better engineered single carriageway than you would typically encounter elsewhere in the trunk road network. As a single carriageway, it's relatively wide, and yes, it does weave about, but it's relatively straight. Those aren't circumstances you typically encounter in many other parts of the trunk road network. If you think any of the roads in the Highlands, 82, 83, 85, the A70, A71, even the A75 uh, down south, they don't have the same wide expanse, if you like, of carriageway. Also, as a pilot, we're comforted by the fact we are dueling the A9, so we're not setting a precedent that perhaps isn't defensible. And with the average speed cameras in place, we can both enforce speed limits generally and target any unacceptable behaviours when they do arise. So the, there are many things which have come together to make an appropriate place for a pilot, which perhaps don't apply in other routes. Are there any other steps that you'd be taking or considering that they take in order to address the fact that there are other roads that are higher up in terms of stats, in terms of injuries per kilometre or fatalities per kilometre, uh, you know, to address it, we're not going to address it through increasing HGV uh, speeds on the road. Yes, there are. We keep these things under review. The criteria that's normally used, and again, uh, you guys can keep me right, is uh, I look back over the past three years in terms of the accident uh, rate, reported accident rate that we have for those roads. And also on other roads, non trunk roads, we just had a major review of uh, all the roads in Scotland where we look at the speed limits in relation to that. But yes, there are reviews. So there's constantly been improvements done around the trunk road network because we believe that's a particular um, issue uh, right the way across the trunk road network. It changes over time. We improve a road, and then there's another road that comes up in terms of priority so yeah it's not the case that we're forgetting about these other roads they are constantly monitored worth bearing in mind that the trunk roads comprise is it six percent uh, or even less than that of the all the roads in scotland and so and those are the ones that we are responsible for primarily so yes the entire trunk road network is kept under constant review um, just going to say briefly, convener, that uh, of all the roads in Scotland, uh, the one that perhaps uh, shares characteristics with the A9 uh, is actually the A1 south of Edinburgh towards the border. Uh, might that be a possibility for consideration in future? Well, again, I think, as I've said, what you have to do when you consider uh, investment decisions is look at the evidence. And the evidence is that the A1 is... Uh, is fit for its purpose and it's safe use. I'm not saying it's accident free. There are no roads which are accident free, but the A1 is fit for its purpose. I think that was the outcome of the STPR when it was conducted as well. There have been improvements there and part of it is dueled, as you know, but we believe, given the evidence that we have, that it is fit for its purpose just now. And finally, just for the record, um, when you do a pilot, you normally have an end date, but can I confirm that what you're saying is the end date will be when the A9 is dueled completely? No, uh, obviously the two things will start to come together as a dueling gets underway. We've said this will be a three-year pilot, so that's what we started off by saying. But um, as I say, it won't be the case. We'll suddenly decide at the end of it, based on the, the, the evidence, um, what should happen. We'll be doing this right the way through that three-year period. But in any event, as I've said, this had we not um, done this um, in terms of the average speed cameras we'd have ended up doing this on much of the route as we as we trunk as we dueled those parts of it which are single carriage but it's a three-year pilot that's, that's been proposed. Okay so you will have some reporting back to the committee in, in three years time? Yes and also on other points that have been made um, by some of the members about uh, the evaluations and the surveys that we do happy to come back at any time to say as we go through the process where we're at with that. Okay that's fine thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, so we move to agenda item two. Uh, the second item is the formal consideration of motion S4M10171, calling for the committee to recommend approval of the HGV speed limit M9A9 trunk road regulations 2014 draft. I invite the minister to speak to and move motion S4M10171. Happy just to move the motion community. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to make any further comment? Very briefly, uh, I think this is a, an excellent decision to go ahead with this pilot. Uh, I think it uh, has been fully justified by the government uh, and has been handled in an excellent way, and I hope this committee will give its unanimous approval to the measure. Okay. So I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M10171 in the name of Keith Brown be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That concludes the consideration of this affirmative instrument.
uh, and we will report the outcome of our consideration to the Parliament. And that concludes the committee's meeting today. Next week, the committee will hear evidence from the Scottish Housing Regulator on homelessness as part of the committee's follow-up to its inquiry on the Scottish Government's 2012 home homelessness commitment. And we will also consider our work programme. And I close the meeting. Thank you.